This is Solving California, billed as the Danish capital of America. A town that celebrates the bittersweet life of a world-renowned Danish storyteller. Learn the history of this town, sometimes called Little Denmark. Discover the Viking heritage and the historical significance of Amber to Danish culture. And moving to present day, check out the most intriguing places to stay, dine, and enjoy the atmosphere. And finally, hear some of my own thoughts along the way. Welcome to California's own slice of Europe. Solvang has a population of roughly 6,000. Solvang is about 130 miles from Los Angeles and about 35 miles from Santa Barbara. Nearby attractions include the Chumash Indian Casino Resort to the east and the Danish restaurant Pea Soup Andersons to the west. But well, let's get back to Solvang. First up, the Hans Christian Andersen Museum, which is a very small space sharing a building with an art shop and a bookstore. Hans Christian Andersen is arguably the most famous and influential Danish writer in history. Although successful in literature, he was not successful in love. He wrote over 150 fairy tales, including The Little Mermaid, The Snow Queen, the Ugly Duckling, and the Red Shoes. In fact, the Red Shoes was made into one of the most beautiful films ever made. Hans Christian Andersen was born on April 2nd, 1805 in Odense, Denmark. This castle gives a modern day glimpse into old Odense. And this is what Odense, Denmark is like today often considered a fairy tale city. This is a scale model of the home in which he lived for most of his childhood. It was created by Santa Inez artist Carl Jacobson. His father was a shoemaker. His mother was sheltered and illiterate, but very loving. They had a landscape painting which had great meaning to him. And they also had a little rooftop garden contained within a box of chives and parsley. There were 1,200 homes in 1801 in the town of Odense. And it was the largest town on the island of Funen, and also the second largest in Denmark. And this is a drawing of the town in 1822. This is a drawing of his boyhood home from 1836. And this is an image of his birthplace, and an illustration of the Danish countryside from the 1850s. Odense had the first Danish ship canal and the first provincial theater. A fortune teller's prediction of adversity followed by fame persuaded Andersen's mother to let him seek his fortune in Copenhagen. Crossing Danish waters required a passport, which survives today. In his lifetime, he took 29 journeys abroad, some lasting many months. He published six novels, a handful of travel books, and numerous stage plays. His life was definitely rough at first. In 1816, his father died the year he turned 11. And he arrived in Copenhagen at the age of 14 with the intention of becoming famous. He would go on to be a pupil at the Royal Theatre's schools of dancing and singing. Then things started working out. In 1831, he traveled to the Hartz Mountains of Germany. In 1835, he published his first four fairy tales and his first novel. In 1840, he met Jenny Lind. More on her later, but she would be his most well-known infatuation. In 1843, he journeyed to Paris and met Alexandre Dumas, author of The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo, and Victor Hugo, author of The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Les Miserables. In 1857, he spent several weeks as a guest of Charles Dickens, and they generally respected each other's works. He met many people, yet he was lonely throughout his life never getting past romantic infatuations. Anderson had been rejected by all these people 
in one way or another throughout his life. And yes, he is believed to have had queer tendencies. His most notable failed infatuation was Jenny Lind, known worldwide as the Swedish Nightingale, considered to be the most famous and adored personality of the 19th century. In fact, legendary P.T. Barnum managed Jenny Lind's triumphant concert tour of America in 1850 through 1851. Thousands flocked to hear her, tickets sold for incredible prices, orchestras and singing societies sprung up along her route, and a mania for Jenny Lind products from hairpins to beds swept the country. Things they had in common were coming from poverty and a love of the theater. They were both deeply emotional and had similar feelings towards their work. Anderson's unrequited love of Jenny inspired some of his most beautiful stories, including The Angel, The Willow, and The Nightingale. Jenny Lind was fond of Anderson, but only saw him as a brother. Well, you came to a video about solving, and you went down a Hans Christian Andersen rabbit hole. The thing is, Hans Christian Andersen is a national treasure of Denmark, and therefore he is a treasure of this town, as this statue attests. And all this is a result of Andersen's lifelong and uncompromising faith in his destiny. In 1867, his hometown of Odense made him an honorary citizen. And, of course, they have their own museum. In 1872, his last tells were published. In 1873, he made his last journey abroad to Switzerland. And in 1875, he died at the age of 70 of liver cancer. Despite romantic disappointments throughout his life, his fairy tales will long be remembered. His fairy tales were sophisticated with a surface meaning for kids and a deeper meaning for adults. Next is the Elverhoy Museum. This museum started as a home in 1949. Built in the style of a large farmhouse in Jutland in northern Denmark. In 1980, a trust was created to donate the house for use as a museum to preserve Solvang's history and its Danish culture, and to celebrate the arts, as it has a public gallery. The museum opened in 1988. Elverhoy is Danish for Els Hill, and Elverhoy was Denmark's first national play, which the house is named in honor of. This is a recreation of a small rural home in 1800s Denmark. The journey to America was inspired in part by the living conditions for many Danes in rural areas. Often there was only one room for the family, and immediately adjacent a small barn for livestock. The Danes, who eventually founded Solvang, were part of the great 19th century European exodus to the United States. Denmark's economy could not employ the growing lower and middle classes. Between 1865 and 1914, roughly 300,000 Danes headed to the United States of America. Many Danes, determined to remain true to their agricultural roots, settled in the American Midwest. In fact, one such community is Elkhorn, Iowa, home to the Museum of Danish America, and incorporated in 1910. 
and it has the only authentic operating windmill in the United States. However, economic growth and good opportunities in California made it easy to leave the Midwest for California. Solvang began as the dream of three immigrants who were living in the Midwest. They set out to buy a large tract of land on the West Coast and subdivide it into lots for farms, houses, and a town. And then profits from the sale of land would be used for building a Danish-style folk school. They would invite Danes and Danish Americans to settle this new colony and grow as Americans while retaining their cultural roots. After an extensive year-long search, they almost gave up. And that is when they learned about a large parcel of pristine land for sale in the Santa Ynez Valley. They founded the Danish American Colony Corporation and in January 1911 agreed to purchase 8,882 acres for $338,000. They named it Solvang, which means sunny field. Danes came from California, and they came from the Midwest, and they came from Denmark. By the end of 1911, 80 adults resided in Solvang. The first baby was born, and the downtown was taking shape. In the early days, Solvang actually had a western look, with masonry and simple wood frames. The founders envisioned a church to be an integral part of the community. The congregation was formed in 1912, but the church was not completed until 1928. Bethania Lutheran Church, built in a style of Danish world churches, would be the first building in Solving to display the heritage of the town's settlers. Solving built and opened a Danish folk school in 1911. Danish folk schools emphasized broader enlightenment through the promotion of independent intellectual thought, rather than rote memorization of facts and a system of grades and diplomas. They contemplated ideas through lecture and group discussion of broad moral and social issues. In 1914, the folk school moved to its new home, an impressive white structure on a hill overlooking the town and was renamed Atudag College. It was the heart and soul of Solvang. It was used, obviously as a school, but also as a meeting hall, a performing arts venue, a lecture hall, a gymnastics center, and a boarding house. It even provided church services until the Bethania Church was complete. But it closed in 1952. In the late 1940s, town leaders recognized that the town was losing economic momentum. This changed with the publication of an article entitled Little Denmark in the Saturday Evening Post magazine. The town was described in glowing terms and brought the town overwhelming publicity. As visitors came in increasing numbers to experience Solving's Danish culture, the town went from just being Danish to looking Danish. Local Danish businessmen and local investors pushed to convert downtown to a provincial architectural style. Buildings were constructed or remodeled with half timber walls, decorative elements, and imitation thatched roofs. The first of three windmills was built in 1957, and street names changed to reflect the town's heritage. Present-day Solvang is dedicated to preserving this style with strict building and architectural codes that maintain the Danish provincial look. And once again, so that you can have a good appreciation of just how much this town changed, here are a few shots of early Solvang. The first Danish-style building in downtown was the Copenhagen Square project completed in 1947. And this is an example of the remodeling of a building throughout the years.
And it is now about time to leave the museum. But first, check out this handmade traditional Danish dress. And then the visitor center recommended the Amber Museum, which also contains a Viking exhibit. This is Snorri, the Viking ship, a Nordic clinker boat. It was reconstructed from an archaeological find of a Viking boat that was originally built in 895 AD and found in Norway. The reconstructed ship was built in the Rosslide Viking Ship Museum boatyard in Denmark, and it is seaworthy. These are reconstructed tools used to build the Snorri. Shield maidens, Viking female warriors. Graves have been found with female Vikings buried with weapons. Berserkers, known to bite their shields out of pure rage, according to the National Museum of Denmark. Apparently bloodthirsty warriors who fought nearly naked, totally dedicating their bodies and lives to battle. No armor, only wearing a bearskin shirt. According to the museum, favorite weapons of the Vikings. The sword, only for the rich. The axe, a tool and a weapon. The shield, for protection and hitting. The helmet, also only for the rich. The bow and arrow, used at the beginning of a fight. Despite popular culture, Viking helmets did not have horns. And there is only one Viking helmet found in the world, this helmet from Norway. And once more, few Vikings could afford helmets, and this is a replica. The Vikings used amber for jewelry, game pieces, and general trading. An excavated Viking village dating back to 700 in Ribe, Denmark, revealed large quantities of amber in both finished pearls, but also raw amber. Amber was called the gold of the north. And check out this exhibit on names. Who would have guessed Helga means sacred? My favorites, Astrid, which means beautiful and loved, and Eric, which means absolute ruler. And meet Holger the Dane, a mythical character actually created in medieval France, but the Danes embraced as their own. According to legend, when the kingdom of Denmark is threatened by a foreign enemy, the stone figure will turn into flesh and blood, and Holger the Dane will rise and defend the country. In fact, a fairy tale was written by Hans Christian Andersen entitled Holger the Dane in 1845. Holger the Dane's most famous statue is located in Kronberg Castle. And that was it for the Solvang Amber and Viking Museum. It is quite small, but then again, I got some cool things to share in this video. Then I went to Olsen's Bakery. I got this, and it was my only taste of solving on this day. Olsen's Danish Village Bakery was founded by Bent Olsen, a third generation baker from Denmark. He moved to Solvang in 1970 and opened his shop. Danish bakeries extend back to the town's beginnings. This is a scene from Berkholm Bakery, another Solvang favorite, opened in 1951 and is another multi-generation family-run bakery. Then there is Ingeborg's Danish Chocolates, which opened in 1961. The traditional chocolate recipes were brought to Solvang by Ingeborg Larsen, who came from one of Denmark's largest chocolate factories. And this is Solving Restaurant, home to the famous Abelskiever, fried Danish pancake balls served with raspberry jam and powdered sugar. The decor includes woodwork by Verd Sorensen, authentic Danish crests, and murals of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales. This is Solving Hotel, which opened in 1911, and was indeed Solving's first hotel. And next to it is the original folk school. 
which is now in use as the Bitte Denmark restaurant, which opened in 1963. It sure looks different. Officially, the highest rated places to stay in Solving are the Landsby and the Maribel Inn. And that is all I have to say on this subject. Then I walked around and captured more places and objects that caught my eye. The weather was quite cool and refreshing for a summer night. That may be the most charming liquor store I have ever seen. Morton's Danish Bakery is another favorite that has been around for numerous decades. This is the Christmas House, a gift shop featuring European Christmas items available year-round. It opened in 1967. I just love this building and all these lights. And the Wildling Museum is a small museum that focuses on nature-inspired art. The highlight of any trip, flying the drone. Hopefully I can make it to Yule Fest this year, a month-long celebration of Christmas featuring a tree lighting ceremony, a parade, a visit by Santa to Solvang Park, food tours and candlelight tours. And please, if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe if you are new.